Hello, and welcome to Climate Culture, the Art of Becoming Sustainable, a series on, of online and physical events examining the important role cultural organisations can and indeed should play in combating the climate emergency. Climate Culture is curated and produced by Onassis Steggy in collaboration with Julie's Bicycle. And this panel addresses a number of themes, including new policies, system change, and some approaches to curation and rooting in transition. So this panel is going to the crux of culture and climate action. After an undeniably slow start, the creative and cultural sector across the world is waking up to the climate crisis and all the other things that climate touches around oceans, nature, justice, what it is to be a human being in relation to the world today. Not only are many people and companies rethinking the what, the how and the why of creative practice, questions forced on so many by the pandemic, but new purpose is driving a rapidly expanding community of creative collaborators. The thing is with the climate crisis is that it covers pretty much everything. The nature of the challenge is multidimensional and intersectional. It's one of the most intersectional issues of our time. And that makes this fundamentally an imperative for policy. In order to unleash the disruptive, the innovative, the entrepreneurial essence of the creative and cultural community, we need policy to support us and cultural policy is not fit for purpose. Cultural policy has been in the main slow to see just how fundamental this is. What does a net zero car carbon roadmap for culture look like? How can we adjust our culture so that it meets the, the, the just transition, it looks to the new deal and it looks to the needs of our young people? With some exceptions, national cultural policies facing the 20th century, not the 21st, and certainly not the 22nd. Not so in cities, and things are changing internationally. UNESCO and the EU Commission are joining the dots, but cult and culture is, for the first time, a theme for this year's G20 summit. And of course, we have got high hopes for COP26, which are the climate negotiations on the horizon taking place in Glasgow. And we really hope that they leverage really big change. We have three exceptional panelists who've been interpreting the arts, culture, creative economy and heritage for many years. And I'm going to introduce you to them all now. They will do a brief introduction to themselves and their work, and then we're going to roll into a, a, a group discussion. So, we have Anais Roche, who's chef de projet secteur culturel climate et énergie. I forgive my terrible accent, all of you. Uh, Bob Palmer, who um, has, uh, he's a consultant and has had a huge, long, illustrious career uh, shaping much of our cultural uh, uh, work in cities. Um, and we also have Nancy Duxbury, uh, who is a writer, thinker, and academic. And my name is Alison Tickell. I'm the founder and director of Julie's Bicycle. So first, I would like to introduce uh, Bob. So uh, he has an extraordinary career, which summed up reveals a man deeply dedicated to culture, creative community, and its role in our lives, heritage, cultural, and uh, cultural rights and how to drive change using this extraordinary toolbox that is the creative community. He's held many directorships, two capitals of culture, Scottish Arts Council, uh, City of Glasgow, and he is also a theatre director, so his roots go into the work itself. He's had a, an enormous role, both in directing and evaluating Capital of Culture, uh, was Director of Culture for the Council of Europe. He's an author, thinker, and international cultural expert. Bob, I'm honoured that you're here and the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks, Alison. I don't think I can live up to that remarkable uh, introduction, but uh, thank you. And also thanks to Onassis Steggy for hosting this event. Uh, Alison, I was listening to your view about cultural policy and the role of cultural policy driving change. And I think I want to make a few comments about that based 
on my experience? Well, I think it all depends on what we mean by cultural policy. Uh, if we mean national or state cultural policy as it's currently framed and implemented by government ministries of culture around the world or conceived by uh, most arts councils, um, my simple answer is there is no relevant role. Uh, national cultural policies are too narrowly framed at the moment, uh, too insular, too focused on vested interests. And despite some fine rhetoric uh, used in policy documents, such policies will only be drivers of marginal and quite inconsequential change when dealing with the major issues of today like climate change and sustainability. Uh, cultural policy as it is implemented in most places is simply, well, uh, insignificant. Uh, I've worked with many governments nationally and locally and on international processes of policy making such policies that I've experienced are just too narrow. Uh, maybe the European Union's approach is a bit wider, but all governments define culture too narrowly. Uh, the policies are primarily designed to fit a silo mentality and to meet uh, the requirements of old institutional structures. So from my point of view, uh, cultural policy will only have impact if it is developed as a shared responsibility and cross-sectoral working across government. And looking at the scene internationally with treaties and conventions and declarations, uh, culture is at present totally marginalized. For example, in the global sustainability and climate change agenda. Uh, culture is always confined to the margins of the margins, the margins of the margins of the COP conferences, for example. The role of culture is not widely recognized in the development space. It is rarely considered as an important component of humanitarian aid and is only peripherally considered in broader development and peace building projects, even to do with mitigating climate change. I mean, this is surprising for me because the climate emergency is not only an energy emergency, it's a cultural emergency. Uh, reducing carbon emissions is partly a cultural issue, not just a scientific issue. A biodiversity loss and destroying ecosystems is a cultural crisis. So um, one of my conclusions is that uh, our wider debate about change, culture and cultural heritage should not be treated as sectors. Culture and cultural heritage are not sectors in this debate. Culture and heritage should be viewed as vectors. Uh, vectors of change, that must work across many different policy areas. And this is just not happening. Uh, problem solving remains in silos with a, a multitude of disconnected policies. There's always talk uh, about systemic change, but this talk is largely rhetoric. The practice is very different. And the policies remain disjointed and fragmented, and many are not sustained over time. So the impact, as I said earlier, is negligible. Um, that's, that's not to say that individual cultural organizations are doing nothing. Uh, many are doing remarkable things. Um, many artists have become champions of issues such as sustainability and social equity and environmental justice and uh, human rights. So my early remarks 
my earlier remarks were really addressed to policy making, because there are good examples of cultural groups and institutions doing their best. For example, uh, organizations are making sustainable uh, energy choices by installing energy efficient lighting and controls. In many places, uh, a new creative ecology is emerging. Um, many artists have developed sustainable production and exhibition methods. Uh, sustainability is powering creative expression. Uh, cultural organizations, in including Onassis Stegi, by the way, I mean, have developed new creative or artistic opportunities as a result of environmental initiatives and are producing or programming or curating work on the environmental themes. This is great work, although sometimes quite isolated from the mainstream. And another important uh, shift, uh, mainly as a result of COVID, uh, is that communications are changing. Uh, everyone, everywhere is actively promoting virtual communications technology as an alternative to traveling. So the potential reach to an audience has never been greater. Just returning uh, for uh, a moment to the cultural policy question and the need for cross-sector and uh, multilateral working, this must be squared with local action because I believe that local communities uh, need to be at the center of the design and delivery of projects. Uh, initiatives should uh, originate in the communities they aim to deliver to. Uh, initiatives should be led and developed in partnerships with local people and make use of local talent, local knowledge, local technologies and materials in their design and delivery. Um, these projects uh, need to invest in training, skills development, sharing of knowledge. They, build, they need to build a local capacity for resilience and adaptation. And there are great examples of local action, although still quite small in scale when compared to the global need. Uh, the cultural work linked to extinction rebellion uh, is noteworthy. So is the, the movement of transition towns and the transition town networks and the work of C40 cities network and of Agenda 21 for culture and the wonderful initiatives of creative carbon in Scotland where I live and, and Julie's bicycle, of course, Alison, there are plenty of examples in every country of the world that should inspire us. But just finally, to return to the point I was making earlier, uh, global consensus building is necessary to drive change agendas forward. Uh, there needs to be a, a balancing of the global mindset with community-based action uh, in the field. And local action, uh, in my view at least, will only bring systemic change if it is situated in the broader a global context of government action and especially multilateral cooperation between different governments at different levels and in different countries. But there remains very significant challenge to achieving such integration. There are still so many barriers around interdisciplinary partnership working, around divisive competition for funds, uh, around priorities. So this will not be done in a hurry. Um, the very final point I want to make is that I, though, although I applaud uh, conferences and meetings like this one, uh, both online and offline, uh, many of these have become just uh, echo chambers where like-minded people agree. We are always preaching to the converted. Um, and for real change to happen, we need to uh, reach out to those who think very differently to us, 
who are on different ends of the political spectrum to us. Uh, even those whose values may not be identical to ours. Uh, for any system to change, it needs to embrace difference. Uh, we need to win hearts and minds by deep listening, by sharing, by uniting in a common cause, although we may each be driven by different motivations and want to use different means. Uh, I, I remain hopeful, but there's still a very long road ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, um, so much. That was such a rich, uh, a rich introduction. It, it, there's so many uh, things that you've revealed, insights, and so much actually to unpack. You, it feels to me like you've gone really immediately and very uh, efficiently to the nature of this beast, so thank you. So I'd now like to introduce our second uh, witness. It's Nancy Duxbury. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you here today, a senior researcher at the Centre for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra, Portugal and a member of the European Expert Network on Culture. So Nancy specializes in culture in local sustainable, sustainable development, picking up some of those themes that Bob brought in, uh, cultural mapping and creative tourism. And Nancy's also worked not just in Europe, but also uh, in uh, South Africa, interrogating culture, creativity and tourism in the context of sustainable development goals and more widely afield. So Nancy, over to you. Thank you so much. I think that my presentation echoes um, Bob's very well, not planned, but this is great. Um, a few years ago, it seems forever, but it was, I noticed it was published in 2019. Um, I was involved in a project in Portugal to create a directory of or, uh, profiles of organizations across Portugal, arts organizations, cultural organizations that had a sustainability or environmental focus to their work. Um, we found a wide variety of definitions of sustainability. Projects that did sustain over time were mainly in smaller communities where there was a real built-in local desire to see this um, initiative continue on. Um, they're really vibrant and imaginative initiatives, but I found myself asking um, what was the greater impact of this lovely work. Um, in, within this, in this document, I wrote a short piece and I, not, I revisited it for this panel. And I noticed that I had recommended that to build forward, they really had to think about increasing the public engagement and widening the impact of having these events engaging with public decision-making processes and policy, not just having an arts event um, or activity, um, and going beyond awareness raising and questioning to inventing strategies for continuous adaptation, and also being a place of demonstration, advancing sustainable practices in alternative ways. Um, Today, our, our question or our mandate is much broader and much more policy focused, but I'm hoping that um, in the various uh, trajectories that my work has taken, I can go from this foundation and add a few thoughts. Um, I want, uh, I'm first going to outline some of the general defining frameworks that are often referenced in terms of connecting culture and sustainable development and in policy. Um, some shifts in the broader scene that are happening, as well as some reflections and tensions that have emerged during the pandemic. And then looking forward, um, considering some insights from research on leading approaches to addressing other complex issues at a local level, um, I also I want to propose um, an envisioning of something like a culture and or a culture plus era that really will centralize cross sectoral collaboration and the importance of boundary spanning going forward. Um, really quickly, there are three main models that are being continuously um, referenced. Uh, in terms of understanding how culture and sustainable development are talked about and connected. 
Um, we see the culture as a self-sustaining fourth pillar of sustainability, which is um, important to have a visibility of culture in these larger discussions. Um, culture as a mediator between all as a view, uh, a way of viewing trade-offs in different fields. And then the third model is more fundamental that we have to be developing a new culture of living together, new behaviors, new mindsets in the world. These three models um, are throughout the research literature. Only the third one really speaks strongly to um, a need to transform our way of life, but all three can be connected. And I think actually combining the three more cohesively might be part of the answer going forward. Um, a few years ago, I was also involved in an article. We looked at cultural policy and the role of cultural policy, and we came up with four strategic lines um, for cultural policy of culture policy for sustainable development and in, in light of comments here um, and other reflections, it was surprising that it did appear quite limited, safeguard, important, but still limited in the broader scheme of things. And particularly today, looking at the climate emergency um, arriving or on our doorstep. So cultural policy really in a sustainable development framework is, is this is at the national international levels um, is focused on um, safeguarding um, cultural practices and sustaining them into the future, greening operations of cultural organizations, raising awareness about sustainability and climate change and fostering a sense of global ecological citizenship in the same way that, or in a similar way than it's been used in the past to foster a national identity. Again, this doesn't see, feel quite enough. Um, coupled with this has been a lot of work to try to integrate culture, make the arguments for integrating culture into urban policy and planning domains. While this has been happening, however, there's been quite a few shifts um, more generally that haven't always been taken up, although I have to say they're taking up more in this um, the integration work. One has been this broadening focus of culture. Um, in cultural planning, mapping, impact assessment, beyond looking at the tangible cultural, cultural assets and the cultural industry sector, focused to something more about the citizens, the way people live, how they relate to their place. And, and in that, there seems to be more um, generative possibilities for change. There's also been, of course, growing attention to community engagement and influence, both in culture and in other areas. And I think a growing desire to get beyond growing numbers of examples and pilot projects and something that makes it more, uh, makes these initiatives more sustained over time and iteratively developed. As well, of course, um, interrelating culture with climate justice and just transition initiatives, as well as sustainable, cohesive and just urban development. There is this need to connect culture more widely. However, when we look back at, at some of the reports that have come up during the COVID times, when it's focused on the cultural sector, it really is focused on the cultural sector. There is a sense that there's a need to reinvent a broken system and look beyond a recovery approach while also looking forward. Um, I just highlighted two items um, here the realization that the nature of the cultural and creative industries is very fragmented, small players, um, problematic situations and a precarity, and this desire or need for stronger integration within the sector as and, and more um, network collaboration, as well as this, this bottom uh, part, the importance of thinking around kind of strategic complementarities. In the context of pandemic, it's been focused on educational and social welfare system, uh, sectors, but I think more broadly. Um, but again, it looks very narrow. Um, in tourism, we see something very similar. There, there's a lot of talk at the moment about change, about having this as a, an opportunity for changing the way things will go happen go for, going forward, transforming tourism, community first, um, responsible recovery, and something we've been working with, the idea of regenerative tourism. 
Um, and the, on the other hand, you see an industry that's really eager to reboot and get going again. And so all of this talk is really lovely, but um, it's small scale practices and how far those small scale practices can be multiplied to make an impact is, is still challenging to determine. So looking forward, other research on mainly um, complex issues at a local level highlight the importance of creating um, untraditional partnerships, weaving together distributed knowledges and resources, the idea that no one organization has the knowledge required to solve the problem. And so you have to by necess necessity network people together to work together. Um, the importance of intersectoral bridges and collaborative governance approaches, they're very much rooted in the communities where these issues are taking place. So my, my forecast for looking forward really is about a culture er plus era, taking all of these um, points that I've brought up to this point. Um, it, it really, post pandemic, there will be such limited resources and the need to bridge initiatives to make larger impact has, has never been greater. Um, and so this, I think we need policy interventions that really address cross sectoral integration as well, or networking as well as interest sector, intra cultural sector integration. Um, creating enablers for collaboration, training on boundary spanning, scaling facilitation, how do you scale up from a project to something that can have a bigger impact. This kind of thing really isn't supported in the current system. And also um, a renewed attention to how to engage community beyond consultation to make really en route um, new, new ways of being, new ways of thinking in the day-to-day -day local practices. Um, so, and envisioning a future, I think of, that relates to culture and connecting culture and sustainability in ways that can foster and amplify these connections. I think there needs to be a space and support or spaces and support for experimentation and iterative evolution over time. These shouldn't be one-off projects all the time that have no identifiable way of, of proceeding forward. Um, there but there has to be this open space for new ideas to emerge that aren't always um, at the service of, of predefined areas. I think the second um, dimension has to be integration, um, cultural approaches and cultural artistic approaches and cultural dimensions within systems throughout processes, not just as an add on at the end or as on the margins of the margins, but something that has it as as part of this integrated thinking going for and acting going forward. And the, and the third aspect is about scaling facilitation. How do you go from project to something greater without just um, continually uh, comparing projects and good practices and going, oh, that's nice. But how does something really um, scale in different ways? Cross, crossing all three of these areas, there should be a renewed attention to community engagement, capacitation um, processes, this enrooting change with the communities in which it's happening, um, as well as, as I've mentioned a few times, co uh, cross sectoral collaboration to develop new perspectives, ideas, and practices through working together. And thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um... Again, uh, a very, very rich presentation, really super. And um, uh, you, you've built in lots of the detail of those, uh, those fundamental uh, principles that, that Bob spoke about in his introduction. So um, my final um, panelist witness is, uh, is Anais Roche. Anais joined the Shift Project in 2019 uh, to look at how the cultural sector in France uh, takes into account energy and climate and has been working on the crossing of cultural environmental issues for, for over a decade. Um, she's explored the power of art and the role of, of creative stakeholders in the transition as we move into uh, a creative ecology as opposed to an economy. Uh, she's worked for COAL which has been a, a 
curating work on climate for many years and was one of the producers behind Art COP21, which is a festival uh, that was entirely focused on climate issues during COP21. It was uh, a really exciting initiative and I think it might still be on the, on the internet. And this has also worked at the Pompidou Centre in Paris, uh, in Berlin's Natural History Museum, and also the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. Uh, so she's had a lot of uh, diplomatic experience of this work alongside her curatorial expertise. So, Anaya, thanks so much, and uh, let's hear what you've got to say. So thank you, um, Alison, for this uh, introduction. So, um... What I would like to share here is my personal experience uh, navigating through um, art, culture and environmental issues and always um, trying to find the most efficient place and the most efficient actions um, for change. So um, this journey started uh, while I was still a student, uh, student in political science, both interested in culture and political ecology. But at that time, I was always researching or um, doing internships in one or the other area. And this until I traveled to Latin America and first to Chile where um, uh, things uh, started to, to change. So I first worked uh, in an NGO supporting indigenous, uh, indigenous communities against extractivism and what they call um, the mega proyectos. I also investigated on cultural practices of indigenous youth, uh, the Mapuche people. And when I learned that Mapuche means people of the earth, um, I really important the environment was in their cosmovision and also in the way uh, we, um, our cultures are uh, structured. But at the same time, I had always been taught to view their beliefs with some distance and, and this rational thinking, knowing that truth and science was not necessarily on their side. But I was already realizing that maybe there were um, cultures and ways of uh, living that would be more sustainable than others, um, no matter if their culture uh, were true um, or not. And then after Chile, I, I landed in Ecuador uh, doing an academic semester at the Andean University, Simon Bolivar, in 2009. I arrived in this country in a very, um, I was very lucky because I arrived in this country at a very uh, important moment of their history, just one year after, um, after the new uh, institution, which um, gives uh, nature uh, rights and uh, which also, um, uh, sustains and promotes uh, interculturality. And the same movement was taking place in uh, Bolivia at that time. I, I also did an internship at the Bolivian Ministry of Cultures, Cultures with an S. And there I observed the importance of uh, indigenous uh, culture in Bolivian foreign policy. And um, they always carried values of uh, ecological good living, what they call uh, bien vivir or um, which has been very, uh, really very important in uh, climate negotiations at the Conference of Parties, like the several um, cups, both for Bolivia and um, for Ecuador. Um, so, and both countries uh, considered climate change was a civilization crisis inherited from the Enlightenment and the great division between nature and culture. So going back to Ecuador um, after this experience in Bolivia, I tried to see how they managed to translate this vision into public policies beyond um, silos that you, you mentioned before, Bob, and uh, fostering both uh, bio and cultural diversity. So Latin America has really been a cornerstone in my professional career and also it changed my mind in, and really opened my eyes on how much culture on um, ecology were uh, intertwined. So, um, but at the same time, um, so I, 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 I finished my master and I experienced some limits in producing knowledge and most of all sharing uh, staying in the academia. So this is how I decided to engage in creative practices um, with the idea that art could also be the field of uh, knowledge production on climate issues. So I studied curatorial practice, and as you mentioned before, um, Alison, I worked for um, COAL, uh, uh, which is a French uh, nonprofit um, uh, standing for a coalition for contemporary art uh, and the environment. 
Um, so we imagine and co-produce Art Cop 21, uh, this cultural agenda and art festival for Cop 21 in, in 2015, uh, which took place in, in Paris. And this is where um, I met Julie's bicycle and, and Alison. Um, and in this program, we had, let's say, two parts, um, uh, basically. Uh, one was uh, giving voice to the artists and creating artworks, raising awareness on these issues uh, with the idea, of course, that um, art could touch people more efficiently than scientific data could do and hoping that artists would um, contribute changing people's mind and, and ways of living. And the second was um, gathering cultural professionals to brainstorm on what the culture is to tackle climate change. And what was its responsibility in this situation? But um, I realized with this experience that um, these were two very different approaches of culture and ecology, which in France also corresponds to two different work cultures uh, who would never talk to each other and neither work. So, and, uh, and actually since 2015, I could really observe um, still from a French perspective, uh, that more and more artists were working on climate um, um, change on the Anthropocene, experimenting new ways of connecting to nature, living with other species, etc. And uh, that more and more culture uh, were programming exhibitions, theater pieces, movies, etc. But in my opinion, um, well, I, I mean, for me, this is not enough, as you already said before, because uh, given the emergency, we have re a real and a, and a physical emergency um, uh, on our planet. So I consider the directors of such institutions don't really feel their whole responsibility um, by only programming new creations that raise um, these issues. But we have the duty today to be more, um, let's say, materialistic. And I think this doesn't mean that symbols, creation, fiction are not important, but that they are all embedded in very um, concrete stuff. <laughs> um, because doing art means consuming energy coming from coal, oil, gas, emitting um, carbon emission, moving people, material. So I know that from Julie's Bicycle's perspective, this is not revolutionary, but um, in France, it still is. <laughs> So, because we love concepts, we love philosophy, we have Bruno Latour, but you're not really good at pragmatic and prosaic decisions and actions. And actually, this is what we need today. So, we need, of course, uh, the artists to create um, new narratives because ours is causing death. But it doesn't make sense anymore to talk about ecology when the way you talk about it is not environmentally friendly. So my statement um, is that, and this is what I support today um, and what I work on in, in the Shift Project uh, think tank, is that culture is not intangible, it's not immaterial. Uh, and it becomes um, clearer when we have a look at the most important carbon emission items. Um, and if we stop thinking uh, of cultural policy just as supporting ideas, freedom, um, uh, and um, freedom of creation, um, which is uh, still the way our um, Ministry of Culture um, um, consider uh, its uh, role uh, today. Uh, Without going into details, uh, we have to, um, as Bob said before, stop working in, into silos and um, culture is also transport. Culture is uh, buildings, agriculture, uh, industry, uh, new technologies. And, um, and we really have to consider all these um, items. And the, the, what I, I can say is that to date, uh, this ecological transition and energy, especially energy and climate issues, do not appear as priorities for the French Ministry of Culture. They still use this sustainable development framework in which actually environment is still the forgotten pillar. So these are all the reasons why I, ha I have been working for more than two years now with the SHIP project. And um, I like this position because the SHIP project is a, is a French think tank uh, advocating the shift to a post-carbon economy. It's a non-profit organization um, committed to serving the general interests through, through scientific objectivity. And uh, we are dedicated to informing and influencing the debates uh, on energy transition in Europe, but um, most of all in, in France. 
And actually, I'm not a scientist uh, nor an engineer, um, but I was a little bit bored uh, of the philosophical debates. Um, I love these debates, but I really had this feeling we were stuck. So I approached the Shift project because I knew they had another work culture, other um, technical and scientific knowledge that could help us in the cultural sector uh, moving forward. And um, and I like being at this place because we produce uh, ideas, scientific data, uh, which are very important uh, to know where we are, uh, what we have to change uh, on what time scale, what is efficient, what is not efficient, where we have to put our uh, own energy. And the second characteristic of a think tank is to influence the debate. So I have um, interactions with the French Ministry of Culture, but also at regional and and uh, local um, levels. And uh, on the other hand, the SHIFT project had never worked uh, on this kind of issue either. So I sometimes have the feeling of being a translator or a diplomat between two universities and one on one side that doesn't like numbers and quantitative approaches and another one uh, who forgot for too long about people being the core issue. So this is what I can share and what I would be very happy to develop on our proposals in the debate. Thank you so much, Anai. So again, so many things you've touched on. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting hearing your perspective, which actually um, really does make the case for action, for strong uh, and focused action in response to our, our material world. Um, really rich thank you all of you for an incredibly rich and thought-provoking uh and very mutually reinforcing um set of of interventions there and um just i think what i'm hearing is there's a number of key sort of themes that are coming through uh, all of them speak to this idea of transformation um that actually everything needs to change as um naomi klein and her famous book title uh, this changes everything it certainly does and really understanding what that inter intersectional approach looks like is is kind of critical um what i'm hearing is a lot of stickiness there's a huge amount of stickiness in um so not so many uh contexts and uh, lots of uh lots of really difficult uh, binary choices between the local and the global and the lack of governance frameworks that are going to support that, um, between uh, focusing on, on certain issues because they have to, have to be focused on, but also recognizing that actually we need to really reach out um, and, and look at things uh, in a very cross-sectional way. And I'd like to start off uh, just with you, Bob, being the first speaker, so you've been quiet for a long time, um, that you, you, what you've identified is a number of really key touch points around uh, local and global, um, and also the, the, the range of interventions. And I'm curious, uh, and I, you, you made a very important point about time, but I'm curious if you... Uh, have seen any examples or if you have got a vision for how some of these uh, this great unfolding that's going on can actually accelerate because again speaking to this time issue we don't have very much of it so the temptation um, is to on the one hand to speed things up but on the other hand is to allow things to emerge very naturally how do we square some of the contradictions that are inherent in process versus uh, speed. Yeah, very interesting dilemma, uh, uh, Alison, um, which I'll have, have a go at just giving you my initial response to, because uh, currently we're in the grip of um, what I call a quadruple crisis. <laughs> so there's a crisis of climate, which has been clearly identified. There's the crisis of economic inequality, uh, a crisis of uh, political legitimacy. And if that's all not enough, uh, the COVID the pandemic, which has added yet another layer. And uh, the first step is to recognize that we are living in a system. Um, 
uh, socio-economic, political, and cultural system that has evolved in particular circumstances and um, is unique to this moment in time. Um, the only way to shift a system is to deal with all parts of it. This is, appears complicated and complex, but it is the only way to make significant change. And although there are remarkable initiatives that are taking place across the globe, and indeed even some governments, uh, but most of the important initiatives are local, there's just not enough partnership building. There's not the ability to bring these different fragments together. And this is what creates the marginalization. And those that have what I'll call convening power, the actual power to bring large numbers of people together are not doing that. And that's largely uh, governments that are mandated democratically to represent their people. So I think there is a, a leadership gap. And if it's not met through government political leadership, and I'm as skeptical as everyone else, probably about the ability of current political leaders to offer that visionary leadership, then the leadership needs to happen on a very collective basis. But even within the sectors themselves that have been identified through all the speakers, even there is no understanding of the uh, reciprocity, the, 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 the way in which each sector is dependent on the other. So there needs to be a coalition, a collective understanding that no one can go forward alone. There needs to be a united view within this. And this is a, a shift in mindset. The mindset needs to shift. And I, I regret to say that it could take even a bigger crisis than the current COVID pandemic to provoke a rapid shift in mindset, that will probably be the only time that people will recognize the need for some very significant changes to the way in which processes are, 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 are developed and the way in which people engage with them. Fantastic, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think what we're seeing now, you're absolutely right, is uh, I think that the notion of reciprocity, the notion of collaborating actually sounds great, but when it comes down to it, when you're having to do that, um, it can be really tough because we're working within the old system. And I think you said right at the beginning, Bob, uh, that some of the tensions were around old ways of doing things, even when we know that they're not fit for purpose, but particularly around governance and compliancy, around funding frameworks, and around the way everything is working in a business as usual way, it's incredibly difficult to break those silos. So um, very, really interesting. Um, Nancy, did you want to comment on that? Because you're focused so much on grassroots practice and some of the, uh, the ways that culture needs to uh, conceptualize itself differently, whatever the itself culture and it, one of the problems is what is culture? Uh, language is so generous around this, but, but do you want to comment on those really interesting uh, observations with Bob's? Um, sure. I, I'm just thinking that um, when you mentioned the breaking silos, I'm involved in another project which I didn't um, present about called Urbanat. And it's actually um, comes out of the uh, nature based solutions. So it comes out of the environmental side, but it's being organized or coordinated by a so critical social science unit. So we decided that we would do it differently. And part of the, it, 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 well, part of it is break trying to break silos and norms of practice among architects designers um, municipalities to broaden their thoughts beyond doing something just green to improve the re regeneration of an area but to also incorporate cultural elements cultural dimensions um, social and solidarity economy the idea that it's a living system it's a living community and if it's a problem it has a, a problems it's not just putting a green corridor is going to help and and so this, uh, they define this um, healthy corridor and, and anyway so there and it also is breaking the mold of experts coming in providing expert solutions and then the community adopts them or not and and has forced everyone to 
have the local community involved through the whole process. What's happened is that um, a lot of uh, realization of how difficult it is to change entrenched ways of working, entrenched ways of thinking, who is supposed to do what, and who is the expert and who is, <laughs> all of that has been thrown up into the air and, 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 and actually getting traction. It's going forward, it's uh, midway through its process, uh, but it's, um, it's been a really important um, realization of how difficult it is to even change proactive, progressive areas of work so that they work together um, and think more broadly about the place they're working. Yeah, yeah, really. With the human being mm -hmm. is a tricky problem. <laughs> all the human beings with all their different perspectives and memories. sapien. <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, it was very interesting because my experience is the reverse of yours, interestingly, where Julie's bicycle so naively and so optimistically 14 years ago just thought that if people realised that we had a carbon footprint, that everything would change. So we spent so much time, particularly that first seven years. And then we realised that, of course, we were missing a tr the, the biggest trick of them all, which is to look at this systemically. So it's really interesting that we've had a very similar journey, but in, on different pathways. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, that actually, again, this speaks to both what Nancy and Bob have been talking about, which is the, um, the kind of unity and diversity, diversity and unity approach, which feels to me like the biggest challenge of the lot, which is how do we come together as a community that are sharing values, but in a context of trust, and I, I wonder if perhaps the real challenge here is, of, of course, it's the depletion of nature, it's the lack of regenerative principles at the heart of the cultural compact and all of that. But perhaps what we're really looking at is a lack of trust uh, and the capacity and the willing to come together in a, in a different way. Would any of you like to comment on that? Um. I can say just a few words and then I'll pass it on. Um, I think your comments about regenerative values and trust and the process of gaining trust and just having this, the, the time factor again, we don't have, we don't have time, but you need time to get used to the other parties. And um, I, I just began reading about this, the scaling processes and, and emphasizing how each domain of, work of, of activity has its own systems, its own values, its own ways of incentivizing uh, work and its own uh, rules of the game. And if you're in another field, you don't know, you know your rules of the game, but not, not the others. And it's really challenging. I don't think we, well, I think all of us are, are, are well, optimistically naive as <laughs> where one hopes you can make it through that bridge and that you can connect across um, collaborators, but it is really challenging once you're in there and the gritty parts of um, trying to, to change systems. Yeah, and perhaps uh, you, Bob's point about, um, and in fact, um, I, I tend to agree that we need an even bigger crisis to catapult us into that you know, there's a there's a bit of forcing. Mother Earth will probably do it for us, uh, mm. but there's a bit of forcing in order to make it as um, as non as obligatory as we need. And I, if we start with you, uh, I asked a question to you before this about what your uh, your vision or your biggest sort of shift, perhaps a policy focus shift, would be. Um, in order to move us into a, a better and a more resilient place? I think we need many shifts <laughs> at many different scales. Uh, but uh, yeah, first um, about working together, we should be more open and find common languages, which is not easy at all. I mean, I'm, I'm experimenting this every day, working in many different areas and um, and sometimes we think we talk about the same thing, but we don't know we are talking about the same thing. So it, we have to move um, all together. And this is why what we are 
thanks to COVID, uh, we worked on that at the SHIFT project. We launched a huge um, meta project uh, called the Transformation Plan um, um, for the French um, economy. And we had uh, people from any sector. So I came, I said, I want to have culture uh, in your transformation plan. How can we work together? And I realized that with uh, my colleagues working on health, my colleagues working on education, my colleagues working on uh, the digital, we had a, a lot of common points. And uh, and we move faster when we move together um, and think together. And I think uh, one of the core issues is also about education. Um, and uh, in, in in France, I mean, if we, but this is a professional uh, view of what culture is and means. I'm uh, talking to uh, cultural um, uh, stakeholders, but uh, we have a lack of. Um, of um, a training uh, in in our uh, higher education in France, um, in the cultural sector sector, and also in other um, sectors. I mean, it, it should be like basic knowledge, knowing what climate change is, uh, what uh, what what is a carbon emission, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have no idea, and if we don't have this physical information it's hard to know um, where we, we should act to be efficient given the emergency. So education is really um, important if you want to shift. Thanks so much. And I, Bob, would you like to put your... I think one has got to accept that a significant change takes time. So, I mean, there's an element of perseverance and patience, you know, and... Um, Perhaps that's something that um, we all just need to recognize and not beat ourselves up to actually recognize the slowness of change and perhaps look a little bit optimistically when there are elements here and there, glimmers of hope. And I think if one looks at the trajectory, say over the last 10 years, uh, it's quite apparent that there is a greater awareness that there are some very positive, proactive and helpful actions that are being taken and that new types of partnerships are being formed. Not everywhere and not always and not necessarily with all the right people, but there is a trajectory. It's this relatively slow one. But I, th I think in terms of people maybe watching this online discussion, um, I mean, each of us now just needs to ask ourselves the question, uh, is the work that I'm doing prolonging the death throes of a failing system? Or am I helping bring into existence a new system that works for us all? Uh, is my work genuinely helping a systems change for sustainability? And I think that's a, a question, it's a personal question. It's one that I think I hear being raised over and over again. And one that each individual's conscience will uh, hopefully at some point enable them to, to answer. These are personal choices that we need to make. But I do feel there is kind of increasing a collective interest and buy-in. Um, certainly looking at it over a period of time. So that actually gives me hope. And I try not to get depressed, recognizing the very, 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 very long road ahead of this, not only for our generation, but the generations that, that come after us. Terrific. Um, with that in mind, we've got just a few minutes left. So um, I'd like to just finish by asking you all perhaps starting with you, Nancy, um, to uh, give us perhaps two or three words of how you are feeling about where we are now at this critical crossroads in our history and with perhaps the most important decade that humanity's ever had in front of us. Um, I'm feeling a bit wary. Think we, we're uh, thinking of how much has to be done, how many connections have to be made in a meaningful way to really take, well, 
take it seriously and also take it seriously right now that change has to be made and how difficult change is. And we see that with the reemergence out of the pandemic and the competing passion. Um, I have to stay optimistic <laughs> um, that, that there are good practices. And I think a focus on local resonance um, is really key coming back to the beginning of, of Bob's comments as well, that um, things have to, I'm sorry. I have a chicken here that's visited and now it's nature is in my office and um, great thank you Nancy and I personally I think that intervention of the chicken could not be <laughs> frankly we all need a bit of nature in our offices thank you uh, and I you would you like to just sort of give a last perhaps summing up thoughts? yeah um well I also try to keep optimistic which is not easy but the best medicine not to uh, feel depressed is really uh, for me it's collective action and um, I think we have to be more uh, ambitious and radical in our um, actions. And we have to learn about how to renunciate uh, more. Hi to the chicken. <laughs> Renunciation is still very hard. Uh, it's a complicated value in our cultures. And we have to learn uh, to slow down on, and not doing things if we know they are uh, so not good for the given the context. Thank you. I think the chicken agrees. <laughs> Bob, would you like to just sum it up and then we'll finish? Well, I think I have um, a kind of naive belief um, in human beings. You know, um, once one gets rid of um, what some of us have been clearly taught or brainwashed in about what society is and what our life is for. Um, and that belief in people leads me to believe as a concluding statement that um, we need to involve people um, in shaping new systems. And uh, I think we need to dig deep in how to do that. Uh, and as many of the other speakers have said, I think the best way to dig deep is locally. And um, probably the intervention in your neighborhood, on your street, in your town, in your city, is an action that each of us should have the responsibility to take. And collectively, that will bring the type of change that I think we're all hoping will be achieved. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to this incredibly inspiring group of speakers. Uh, if you don't know their work, I'd really recommend uh, that you go and check it out. It's uh, it, It's got a huge amount of richness there and uh, lots and lots to think about. So thank you, Nancy, Pasqua, Bob, and, um, and everybody at Onassis Stegi for helping to organize this great series of sessions. Thanks. <laughs>